Welcome to History Museums or Not, Art Museums, Discuss. Um, we want to emphasize the Discuss part. Um, <laughs> we have um, a, a panel here of, of four with one um, visiting us virtually through a Google Hangout. Um, and I think what um, all of us want to talk about is um, some of the differences um, that stem from disciplinary differences in interpretation of, of objects and content between history, art, science as a discipline, and then how that can um, affect, obviously it certainly affects interpretation in a physical museum, but then how that translates to the web. Um, you know, one of the things that we have found uh, going to some of these museum tech conferences is that a lot of the innovators are coming from the art museum world. And that's fantastic and that's awesome and they're providing some really excellent um, examples. Um, and sometimes that works and is helpful um, and applicable in a history museum setting and sometimes it's not. So this, we just sort of wanted to maybe publicly acknowledge that and then create a space where we could all kind of talk through some of these things, talk about differences but also real ways that um, everyone can learn from one another. Um, so let me just do some brief introductions. Um, I just want to say again, for those of you who just arrived, we do have a public Google Doc if you're interested in sort of following along. Um, here is our shortened URL. It's um, a bit.ly slash history museums MCN. So I'm going to scroll down just so that you <laughs> so that I can. You should feel free to like take notes session notes and add to the document and all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Oh, actually, I, you know what, I'm not sure. You didn't I, make it publicly I, available. Right. I published it, but I didn't. I'll, I will do that um, in a minute. So um, I just want to introduce all of us briefly. Um, my name is Sheila Brennan, and uh, I am the Associate Director of Public Projects at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at uh, George Mason University. And um, that's, I have a, a PhD in history that I got at Mason, and prior to that, I worked at, in the museum world for about seven years doing museum education and started um, <coughs> dabbling with museum web work early on. Um, Eric Johnson, who's at the end of the table there, is um, a librarian who's working now as the head of outreach and um, Consulting at the University of Virginia Scholars Lab, <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, Eric is uh, formerly of the uh, of Monticello. Um, he recently made the move over to Scholars Lab this summer, um, and um, sitting next to him is Sharon Leon. Uh, she is the director of public projects at the Royal yeah. Society for History and Media, um, and just to give you a. a an overview of public public projects is we <laughs> work with libraries, archives, and museums, um, uh, collaborating on, on grants and, and contract projects and such. Um, and then joining us from Washington D.C., who is not paying attention right this minute. <laughs> no. Uh, sorry. sorry. Uh, can I tell you my boss just stopped by? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> so, um, so this is David Clevin. And he's the Education Manager for Technology and Distance Learning at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C. Um, and we also had a, um, a fifth member who was not able to um, travel um, here with us today. And where's Barbara? So she is the Academic Director of the, see, the Deerfield Teaching Institute and um, is the director of a number of teaching American history projects at the um, Pocomtuck Valley um, Historical Society in Deerfield, Massachusetts, and was also one of the um, project members of the, the Raid on Deerfield project, which was a, um, a, a website from 2004 to 2005. Um, telling, using multiple voices, and talking about different perspectives on that um, events that happened in that particular year. So, you know, more. so um, you will notice in the Google Doc that we had some questions that we posed ahead of time, and Barbara has responded in the doc. So she was not able to do a Google Hangout with us today because of some other meetings, but we do have her sort of voice included. So we've tried to be as flexible as possible. Um, particularly as everyone is dealing with um, travel restrictions, budgets, cuts, and all of those unpleasant things. 
So um, what I would like to do is just um, quickly um, go over some data. Yeah, data. David, you're going away just for a minute. <laughs> okay. Um, as I pull this up, and I apologize for turning away because of the direction of the mic. We wanted to David to be able to see you all, but occasionally I need to use the laptop. <laughs> Um, anyway, I, um, back in 2004, I, uh, well, I was working on a um, field statement for um, my program at Mason, was really interested in how history museums were um, presenting their content online, um, how and if they were engaging visitors and in, in what kinds of ways. Um, you know, what were they doing with collections, with online exhibits, uh, teaching materials, online field trips, any of those things. And so I um, embarked on a study. Um, my advisor at the time suggested that I do some sort of, you know, sampling of history museum websites. And so I um, looked at 85 websites and sort of created a little um, rubric for checking through, you know. And at that time, number of pages seemed sort of like an issue because there were a lot of really small sites. Um, and, um, but I was looking also, as I said, to see like, are, was anybody um, writing long narrative exhibits? Were they um, doing, uh, you know, did they have a, a published, had they published their collections database? Um, and so I decided, and what I, I mean, what I essentially found is that they weren't, history museums weren't sharing that much. There were certainly some notable exceptions. Um, and so, I did this again um, in 2011, and I decided to basically try to replicate what I had asked before in 2004 and see what, um, see what kind of differences there are in, in the type of content um, and the type of engagement that history museums um, are, what they're doing on their own sites. So all of this, by the way, is available um, I made mean, it all public, so please feel free to use it. And the, the best place, I did link to it in the in the document, but is to go to lot49.org, which is my um, my website, and you'll just be able to, to find it. It's the first blog post there today. Um, so I've broken it down sort of content types, collection access, teaching materials. Um, I added a social media presence for 2011, which didn't really exist in in 2004 just to get a sense of, again, like we're, I wasn't necessarily interested if museums were on Facebook, I mean sort of, but I was more interested like are they using Flickr, are they using YouTube, and in what ways are they making use of, of free tools. Um, and so the kinds of questions that I asked or I sort of looked for, um, you can see sort of on the left are kind of my, my rubric, which is not necessarily the most rigorous, but it's what I sort of started with in 04 and to create some kind of um, similarities, I had to do that. And I also provided some examples. So, um, and not surprising, um, we've got a lot of museums that are still just offering um, about 67% just a list or a summary of exhibitions. So you can't really learn too much from their online content, you really still have to go to the museum. Um, one surprising, and I did create a nice little, um, one thing that I found surprising, and I, I really have to do a little more analysis to find out exactly why this is true, but there does seem to be a difference in 2004. There was more narrative <laughs> available on these sites. Now, I, I've got to say also, is not necessarily the same, I'm not necessarily looking at the same sites. Um, I took, for 2011, um, a list of members from American Association of Museums um, who identify themselves as history museums, and there were 1,700, 1,100, I can't remember now exactly how many, um, there were total, and, um, counted down 10, so we started with the first one and counted down 10, so it was, was you know, a, a representative sampling. Um, what's that? 1,200, 1,179. 1,200, okay. Um, and occasionally there were some sites that didn't have websites, you know, museums that didn't have sites. Um, 
and um, so I just sort of moved on to the next one. Um, that didn't exist in 04. AAM wasn't sharing their member lists then, um, so there was another um, site that listed all kinds of history museums, and that's what I had used. So again, all that I published all of that, so you can kind of go through and you can do your own analysis. And in fact, I would encourage it. Um, so. Um, just briefly, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I know this is something that you all can, can do on your own, is that the availability of um, collection databases has increased quite a bit. Um, let me just scroll up here. If we go to collections access. Um, before there were only a handful, I mean still now there are there were at least 20 museums, uh, there were 20 museums that um, I surveyed who provided a nice search of their collections. Um, and again, I didn't do any rigorous analysis of the metadata associated with all of those collections just because of the sheer volume of what I was looking at. Um, but again, the fact that it was there is, I think, an important, an important step. Um, what I feel is still missing, and I'll talk a little bit about later, is some context around all of those collection objects. <laughs> um, and briefly, in terms of teaching materials, um, what is available, you know, about 70% of museums are not offering anything other than a list of educational programs, public programs, and contact information. Um, again, there are some notable exceptions. There are a few um, museums that are doing some online, um, they're doing web conferencing, or they're doing other sort of um, online field trips, um, but still generally, um, oops, not much. Not much is available for teachers. Again, notable exceptions. There certainly are plenty of um, history museums that are sharing a lot, but in terms of looking at the entire scope of U.S. Um, history museums, there's not a lot there. Um, social media presence, just really quickly, um, you know, we've got about more than half museums are on Facebook. Um, and but still about 42% have no presence um, whatsoever. Um, again, I didn't analyze how exactly, um, how they're engaging. I mean, it's sort of like most of the time it's public program related, um, which is fine. That sort of becomes a marketing tool um, in some ways. But I also noted the combinations, which I think are kind of interesting to look at in terms of where museums are. So Facebook seems to be a starting place. Um, when they're jumping in, then and some are on Facebook and Twitter. Some then also have a blog, or they might just have a blog and Facebook page, or um, and some are on YouTube, some are on Flickr. Um, but there are fewer museums using Flickr as a place to share um, digital images and photos, and that I was a little surprised at. Um, and you can look at that. Um, I do have. This was just my general site info was more just a, a comparison that like now pretty much everybody shares visitation info, whereas in 2004, it was about, you know, only 66% had like, how could you actually get to the museum, which seems sort of surprising to me that I'm glad to see that's changed. <laughs> um, and then you can go through and look at, this is the, the spreadsheet I used when I was collecting everything. So it's, um, and I have not cleaned it up too much, um, you know, so there's still some notes, but you know, please feel free to go through and look at um, you know this particular snapshot of the History Museum web in 2011. So I think now would be a good time to sort of jump into, or a little bit behind, into our first question of the day about um, how do disciplinary approaches to history, art history, art composition for scientists affect interpretation on site and offline? So I'm going to hand it over to Sharon. Very good. And if there's anything you want me to pull up or if you want to just. Um, it may be that I got the, uh, the big elephant in the room. The first question is that there, there are disciplinary differences and that, that, we, um, that we need to acknowledge them. And I, my feeling on this after now close to 10 years working in collaboration with libraries, museums, and archives, but specifically history museums, um, is that there is, in some ways, because art museums have had this tendency to be so much far further out ahead 
than history institutions, um, that we have taken them far too literally as a model of what we should be, what we should be doing and what we should be building. And I would suggest that maybe the thing that we should be doing is going back to the cognitive science about how people learn history and how people interact with uh, historical items uh, and objects because if we're going to take the approach perhaps of, of an art museum and put our collections database online, um, the major danger is that the public learns to interact with that material purely as aesthetic objects and not as contextualized items in history. Um, and you know, Sheila's suggesting that, that there's a variety, a, a wide range of metadata associated with, with those objects. But I would say that um, there's a lot of good resources out there that might guide us in cognitive science. And one of them is um, a set of materials produced by the National Academies around 2000, 2001, um, 99, called How People Learn. Um, and it was a set of studies that really um, spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly. And it focused actually particularly on K-12, but it, that's absolutely applicable to lifelong learners. Um, and focus on some things that we already know, and that is that people come to historical uh, questions with a lot of preconceptions and prior knowledge. And if we don't meet that prior knowledge where it is and then build content around it, we make no impact whatsoever. Um, and so in order to do that, we've got to think about uh, the kinds of activities and inquiries that historians actually engage in that your curators actually engage in, that your experts actually engage in on a regular basis, and pre present that type of address of materials to visitors so that they learn to make a meaningful connection with that material, the material that we carefully frame for them, so that they can then begin to transfer those disciplinary things towards um, material that might not be framed so well. And so I'm thinking, you know, in these respects, that the primacy of sourcing for historians is utmost. And, and that's probably, in most cases, not the first thing that a visitor to a digital site does. They look at the, th they look at the object. But any of us who are practicing historians look at the object for a couple of seconds and then go, who made this? And where? And why? And when? What was the, what was the context of, of creation? And then we go back and, and read closely and carefully. Um, and so that if we can set up framing that encourages visitors to take some of those disciplinary approaches and, and use them slowly and carefully one at a time, an object a day, an object a week, something like that, um, that would be one way to begin along that path. But the other, the other clear difference is that, you know, science museums are, their activities and their content is framed around the scientific method. Um, and that experimental interaction with materials. And if, if we as history museums can provide a little bit of mystery and detection for our audiences, we may actually start to develop a, a local historical consciousness that brings people back in a way that they're invested in the history and not just the stuff that's interesting and cool as interesting and cool. Um, but the other thing is that our institutions are repositories of great knowledge. That's my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. In March of technology. <laughs> Oops. Wow. It's been a really long time since I've had that happen. Uh, <laughs> I very rarely even leave my ringer on. I apologize. Um, we try not to do that in the museum. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, we know that our institutions hold a tremendous amount of context knowledge that we have to we have to find a way to share with our visitors because if we don't address their preconceived notions with some additional content we're not going to unseat those preconceived notions that may not be um, mm -hmm. may not be terribly founded well founded in in data um, but I think that 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 a goal of making the cognitive approaches of historians visible to visitors 
so metacognition for visitors, uh, will actually provide an investment in our content and our institutions in a way uh, that art museums have already figured out how to do. Art museums have already figured out how to frame their content so that it is important to visitors to engage in careful looking and careful interaction in the, with the aesthetics of the object. And so before we, before we start to build, before we start to create, if we can identify the threshold concepts of our discipline and bake them in, we'll have much more success. Um, so that's my, that's my feeling on, on that. I open it up for yeah, conversation. For, Absolutely. Because one, one of the things I think is really interesting, um, I was doing some research into sort of the, the growth of basically public science, you know, as mm -hmm. public history, the same sort of public presentation of science. And there was a very intentional, I mean, sort of building right on this thought, that there was very intentional um, action on the part of various scientific institutions to say, Basically, look, we need science to become popular so that we can be funded, so that you know there's there's sort of this all this um, kind of helpful iterative return f for making science popular, and and institutions then set about building a program towards that. And I can't help but keep wondering, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not I mean, basically, yeah. what you're just saying, you know, this idea that that maybe history museums and other historical institutions, NEH, you know, other organizations might not. Um, kind of consider, you know, a real, you know, all right, let's, let's figure out what are the history skills that we want the public to have and how do we want to make history popular so that we never lose, you know, not, it's not just about funding because, of course, what would they want funding for is for the educational right. possibilities that ongoing support allows. And, and so I'd love to see that. It's not that history is not popular. Yeah. Right, right, absolutely. I mean, you know, not. every time we turn around, there's a new sort of history detectives, genealogy show, right. there's the history network. Yeah. I mean, ver various kinds of history are popular, and we probably need to take a much closer look at what is appealing about those shows. And I would argue that what is appealing about those shows is the inquiry, is the actual act of doing and participating in history. And I think also personal connections. And, and personal questions. Very often that starting or that, that first project, even when you're in middle school, of like doing your own genealogy, your own family history project. Right. But that's to, to get you to start to look through, you know, um, look at the past in a different way. But I think the challenge, and that's one of the things that, you know, that Sharon brought up right away, is combating those, the personal context, the collective memories that, that each visitor brings with them. Um, that they think that they, you know, that they know. It's not they, I mean, that they know about whatever topic, subject, specific event. And so that, and that's where some of this conflict can <laughs> and, to, and, and to address the, places of learning. to address the important distinctions between historical memory and historical practice, mm -hmm. in that historical memory is important and it sh serves a cultural use and we should address that too but that they, they aren't the same thing. Right. Yeah. Any of you all have thoughts on that? Yeah. We will have time at the end, too, yeah. if you want to mull everything over, but we figure we might as well take a couple of questions. So, yeah, Mia? Oh, I, was, um, I tweeted as well, but I thought one of the things that popular history shows do is they set up a really strong narrative. It's about storytelling. Mm -hmm. right. It's that kind of clear takeaway that even if you're not following the question, you're, you've got a clear path that you're going down, you're just kind of led by yeah. that, and you can choose to be more or less actively engaged with it, but it, it makes it more accessible because you don't have to be as actively engaged. Right. One of the things I find troubling about that aspect about those programs, though, is that it's unilinear, and that's something that we actively as historians reject, that there is one story and that there's one cause and that there's one perspective, and so that if there's some way that we can find a balance presenting mul multiple causality and multiple perspectives and, God forbid, historiography. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Scary word. <Wow>. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so, so this brings to my, and, and I also tweeted mine out to the, okay. good, but um, the, you know, I, so, I sort of wonder you know, how much of this is really in a, it, it aestheticizing historical objects versus the cost involved to create that or to recreate that context because much of it is a, you know, is stored in 
hardbound manuscripts or, or, or books, uh, scholarly catalogs, etc. And and creating context is actually really hard. Oh, yeah, huge yeah, right. hard challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It so, is. And yeah. so it's, what I'm wondering is, you know, what is the balance? You know, do you do you do something like curated collections on the web, which is what had been done, 1993 mm -hmm. through. 2004, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. where they really focused on very specific items mm -hmm. rather than just get it all out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Right, and very specific interpretation. I mean, like I can think of like between 03, 04, 05, a number of really expensive, beautifully designed exhibits that were all you know online exhibits, all sort of wrapped in flash. Nothing mm -hmm. could be sort of pieced out at all, and there were these beautiful narratives, you know, and 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 you know, collaborative projects, like I'm thinking um, Lewis and Clark um, anniversary, um, mm -hmm. other, um, maybe a more perfect meaning, uh, but yeah. others that, yeah. you know, um, you, there were a few different paths, like entry entryways into yeah. what was there, but it still was very um, incredibly well planned out, and there was not necessarily an opportunity to challenge that specific interpretation, yeah. so. Um, but I think we'll probably get back to that also at the end, where yeah. I want to talk about too, like what's the point of to go to Coven's question from yesterday, which what's I missed. But what's the point of a museum website, and what's the point of a history museum website, that kind of thing? So yeah, I'm hoping you this, this sort of touch up. I'm hoping you'll address it further along. What about when your institution? Quite honestly, our collection is not interesting or relevant. It's our story, and our story is a very difficult one because we're discussing slavery in New England in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how yeah. do you discuss difficult issues without making people feel? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that is a... That's why every yeah, year at question. NCPH there's a session on hard conversations. Yeah, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. And I do, and it's actually a shame that Barbara is not here because she has, they have dealt specifically with that issue. But I think mm -hmm. My short answer, and I, I think we will come back to this, is that's what you can use the depth of the web to do, is to be able to provide multiple perspectives. Even if the objects don't have to be yours, the story doesn't, you know, like you can pull yep. in from other sources and the more that there are um, Creative Commons and, uh, you know, publicly uh, available sources and other, you can pull data, things in stuff, yeah. um, to tell and propose different stories about this difficult. Yeah, yeah I think the, okay. yeah, the me okay. mechanics of yeah. that multiple perspective stuff is just, like, I, I don't think any of us has sort of solved it. You know, like, there's it's an right. easy, you know, uh -huh. there, there's no easy, like, out-of-the-box solution to present multiple right. perspectives, to present uh -huh. difficult material, but, boy, we uh, got to keep talking about it. So. Uh-huh, yeah. So I think that um, this ties nicely into our next question, which is um, for you, David. Um, which is, all right, here we go. How can digital media introduce museum visitors to the process of history making? So we talked a little bit about that in sort of the cognitive yeah, sense and um, yeah. some of the science applied. And David, why don't you lead us off? Um, okay. Can folks hear me okay? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, we can. Perfect. All right. And I think that also earlier, if I post stuff in the chat section on Google+, can folks see it or not? Um, let's see. All right. Give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you're yeah, he's there. actually virtually generated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Also, I, I just um, think we created a little hashtag. Yeah, I can't, I'm sorry. I meant to say oh. that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, which is just H M N A M, so history museum, not art museum. <laughs> H M N A M <laughs> hashtag. Yeah. So All right. Excellent. To that. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm probably going to keep my, uh, as my statements as brief simply because yeah. I'm in a cubicle, which means that all my neighbors can hear me, so I'm kind of self-conscious about that. Uh, but also because I'm really interested in the discussion here. Uh, most of our focus here at the, at the Holocaust Museum on trying to engage folks in the process of history making online has taken place in the context of, I'd say, three projects, one of which has been a rather uh, intensive pilot project, which we are launching pretty much right now um, as a more formal project, and that's the, uh, 
the Children of the Wedge Ghetto uh, Memorial Research Project. And then two others were projects that came out of our marketing division in the last year. Uh, one called Remember Me and one called the World Memory Project. And they all take a very uh, different approach toward engaging folks in the process of history making. Um, probably the one that is least connected to actual history making uh, per se is Remember Me. Um, and I hope to share these by showing to you on the screen. However, it's not working on, on the computer I have right now. Um, remember me, I'm pretty sure you can access simply if you want to on your own computer at this URL. So I'll test it out right now. Yeah. Yep. Uh, is it working for you? Yep. Yep. And I Good. Can, uh, I'll open it up for. Um, and the interesting thing about this is it has Burger a fairly minimal ask of the user. It's part of why I myself wouldn't call it so much asking them to do history so much as asking them to help us connect people, to essentially gather data to help us make history. So it's um, in this sense, it, I, I even hesitate to call it crafts. Really the main thing that your average person would do with this project is to share the link through their social channels. Um, in rare cases, there are people who actually will recognize people in these photos. The whole goal of this project is to find people who recognize some of the children in these photos and help us find out how um, to And to date, to date, it's been incredibly successful. Uh, so here, a fairly light lift that we're asking of our, of our constituents. I'm going to go by these very quickly, and then if you have more questions later, later I'll be to talk about them. Uh, the next one that I mentioned was the World Memory Project, which you can just go there. And this one, this one is something that we launched in partnership with Ancestry.com. And so this gets at a little bit the question about okay, folks treating objects, are, are, are history museums acting like art museums because of the aesthetic value of their objects and because they appreciate that or just because it's a real heavy lift and a lot of resource commitment to really engage folks in doing history. And I feel like it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. I, think, uh, yeah, I think we all feel that we have some truly beautiful objects in our collections and we appreciate them as such. But to really engage people uh, in doing the hard work of, um, of doing history, it's, it's resource intensive, it's been my experience, whether it's online or not. Um, so the World Memory Project, we partnered with Ancestry.com, and uh, we're trying to create the largest online collection of documents related to the Holocaust out there. And what we're doing is we're providing um, scanned, digitized images of our documents to Ancestry. Ancestry has a special tool where people can register, log in, get access to the documents, and then key the data uh, for entry into databases to make the data searchable and usable. And in this process, we're essentially unlocking the data that's stored in the documents in our collection and making millions and millions of documents searchable and usable both for people to find information about their loved ones, but also for researchers. Um, and as you can see, we have over 2,000 contributors to this project, people who are contributing their time to do the king. And in only a, only a few months, really, they've uh, added over 750,000 records uh, to make them available. So again, is this making history? Is this really doing history? No. I mean, in a lot of ways, this is still basically people doing the grunt work of history, right? Mm -hmm. They're going there, looking at documents, giving them access to primary sources. But really, what they're doing in many ways is data entry. So the pilot that I mentioned earlier is this. And this is the. Children of the Watch Ghetto Project. And actually what I'm going to try to do, because I think that this could probably be more consistent to me, 
is, and because Google Plus allows me to do this, but won't let me share my screen, I'd like to show you a short YouTube video. <laughs> okay. See how it and we'll see if it works. Okay. So and I have to come... click over to YouTube? Or are you, uh, are you just gonna, what are you gonna do? If you try to oh, share it. See, I'm gonna try to oh, to the and then you, yeah. Is that yeah. working? Yeah. Yeah, 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 it says I'm gonna switch to YouTube within this screen. So give it a second. Um, okay, so I'm at YouTube. <laughs> are you, okay, are so you, can you see that, or is that? Why don't, so it's you, not doing. Why don't you post the um, post put the, the link in the yeah in the chat box, and I'll and we'll play it from here. We'll play it from here. All right, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay, because I'm trying to, right now. It's playing for me, not for you. Um, uh -uh. Here we go, I'll put it in the chat box, hold on. Yeah. I can't get it to stop looking for me, which is kind of annoying. Probably just gonna open up it in your window. Yes, that, that's mm -hmm. okay. Do you want us to show the whole thing? Yeah, I think it's only like two minutes or three minutes long. That mic, I don't know if that mic's on. Okay, is it, is it over? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, over. so I, um, all right, I, I wanted to show that to you. Oh, now I'm getting an echo, weird. Oh, Hold probably because I, well, I had to mess with a few things here. I'll turn this. Okay, I think it's okay. Is that better? Yeah, okay. thanks. Sure. Um, so just a few points. You may have noticed when you watched that video, you hopefully you were thinking, yeah, that's nice. That sounds like a lot of work because <laughs> if you listen closely, the museum has to verify the data that people are submitting um, before we're willing to put it in our database. This is not a pure, uncontrolled, wiki-style crowdsourcing project. And as a matter of fact, when folks do the research, we're providing carefully defined field, fields into which they're entering their data. And 
I hope that you'll visit the site and tool around in it, you'll notice that it's currently very text heavy. So when we talk about aesthetics and about objects, this is inherently about data and information. And one of the things that I, I was really nervous about it. I, I thought, oh God, you know, folk, who's going to be interested in this? And what's fascinating is seeing that the kids who realize that this is real, that they really are helping us find out what happened to people and helping to have us, helping everybody to better understand the historical record, really, really get it and they really like it. Um, and one of the most heartwarming anecdotes I had just from this week was that there were these, we, we added a feature to the site where if someone really demonstrates that they are producing good research and providing good feedback to other researchers, we added a tool so that we can elevate their status to expert reviewer oh. and they and then and then they can review other people's research it's still it's it still isn't it still isn't top level tier review that still goes to the to a museum site admin but it takes some of the pressure off of the museum site admin to give immediate response because we know that if the community is giving feedback to each other we don't have to get it out immediately which we never will do so at the same time we were looking at game theory and the idea of leveling up and the idea of trying to help people get motivated to go to another level. And we knew this was a way to do it. And so this week there were two kids from George Washington University who we elevated to expert reviewer. And when we notified the, the, the professor, the professor said, oh, wow, that's amazing. These kids are too, when it comes to writing, uh, to their write, writing skills and writing, written communication, they're two of my two of my worst students in that area, and I'm so excited that that you've found something that they can really, you know, demonstrate their skill in and excel in. And it was just a really wonderful moment. Um, the uh, okay. we're constantly looking for ways, though, to, for people who are using the site, not only to um, to test theory but also then to synthesize data. When the site first launched, information was sort of fragmented. You'd have a student's name, a birth date, an address, but you didn't have the pieces all put together in a narrative. And so we added something to the site where users could do that. Um, and we're concerned about that feature. We're concerned about whether people will use it effectively, about how we uh, handle version control, and about whether it's perceived as accurate and authoritative or not, because it doesn't go through the same vetting process as the individual pieces of data. Okay, Let's, um, um, why don't we um, just throw it out to the crowd just for a, a couple of quick comments and then we'll probably come back to some of these similar questions um, at the end. How about anybody in the audience have immediate questions or or things that, that you're or doing in your own institutions yeah. to engage? process. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Oh, that was just me asking if, if folks had um, activities of their own in their own institutions that they're doing to engage audiences in practice. Yes. Um, I'm from the Virginia Historical Society, and we have embarked on a new project, um, actually just launched in September, called Unknown No Longer. And we are skimming our uh, manuscripts collection for slave names, mm -hmm. um, extracting those and putting them into a searchable database where um, users can go in and search for their ancestors and find out information about um, their owners, the plantations, their um, occupations uh, while they were enslaved. And that has been a very successful project for us and we've only skimmed the surface um, so far, but it reminds me of what was just presented. Great. We'll add that to the Google Doc. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So, Anybody else? Oh, John. I just want to throw out there, it's really interesting to me, I'm with HistoryPin.com, which is kind of a massive public history project. In this space of doing history, you know, what that means to the public is a really interesting question. And I feel like with this kind of thing, we're starting to blur the line between crowdsourcing and social networking, where that difference of contributing to, to history and the work of history, but then contributing your own history and your own memories and, mm -hmm. and how that those blurred lines is creating a really interesting dynamic space and, and questions for history museums particularly. It's, it's an interesting thing because we also frequently on this site, are, it, with increasing frequency, we're having uh, children of survivors coming to the site and posting information about their parents. And it, it raises an interesting issue for us 
because we um, we we require that most users s provide source for their data, provide uh, documentation. And so when the childhood survivor says that their parent was in a certain place at a certain time, then we're always going to sort of challenge other members of the site to try to find converging data to, to help us confirm that information. Um, and and it, raises, it raises important questions for the users on the site of how do we know what we know? And how many sources does it take? And is there a qualitative difference between memory uh, 60, 70 years after the fact or oral history and written history, which also is fallible. Records kept in time are fallible as well. Um, and it's a lot of fun watching the struggle with that. And, uh, and we struggle with trying to justify when is something possible or confirmed? What does it take for a piece of data to be listed by the museum as confirmed? And I don't know that we've defined it as, as well as we would like. Yeah. I think this is actually an excellent time to um, segue into um, Eric's sure. question which is about um, the risks of engaging the public in um, history making. Is that right? What are the risks of engaging yeah. the public in, in content creation? So it is actually an excellent, um, nice way to transition there. Yeah, I mean, in sort of my basic thought, and of course, you know, the risk, you say the risk to whom, you know, the risk to the institution, mm -hmm. the risk to the public. Um, but I think the biggest risk for the institutions probably, uh, and building on a lot of what was just said, is, is in essence, if you're unclear in your own mind about why you want public participation, <laughs> you know, I mean, is it outreach, which is a absolutely valid reason to do something like that, or is it to get sort of the, the raw material for the historical work that your institution is doing? I mean, for instance, um, some of the Center for History and New Media's projects around the 9-11 mm -hmm. archive um, and the, the um, Hurricane Memory Bank, the, you know, where they're gathering people's recollections, um, people's, you know, firsthand experiences with these events so that, in essence, historians down the road, I mean, especially, but of course it's being used now, but but so that those are captured and preserved for for later use. Um, and I think that, that, you know, that's sort of a very, that, that's a low risk you know, participation from the public because they are sharing their very valid firsthand experience um, perspectives that, you know, basically what I sort of see in my own mind, I don't know if it's a really valid way to look at it, but bear with me, uh, is, is sort of that there are circles of participation by the public. Um, you know, people can contribute these kinds of raw materials on which historical, you know, museums, um, history is done, you know, material um, providing, you know, again, that sort of primary source material. Um, another circle of that is sort of public reaction to things that your institution is doing. And that can be anywhere from just participation on a Facebook page, you know, where they're just sharing their own opinions and perspectives about stuff that you've sort of put forth or, again, that you may have gathered. Um, and, and mostly that's what I'm thinking is sort of the opinion side of reaction mm -hmm. or you know, I just want to share my experience. That's sort of the community building in a lot of ways. Um, another way, you know, another circle is sort of this um, helping with the, almost the curation work. And so that, that sort of feeds into some of this you know, transcription kind of work, um, and especially the stuff that Perry and then Ben were talking about the last session, you know, this, the, the labor side of things is part of that. Um, and then also these things that sort of have come up at a couple of sessions that, that I personally term, um, and you know, I've mean, sort of used a couple times now already, but these communities of passion, I mean, whether it's the genealogists who mm -hmm. want to weigh on things, whether it's the train spotters that are so happy to help you identify this random little part of, you know, a, a you know, late 19th century railroad you know, tie or something, you know, that, that there are people who have such really interesting esoteric knowledge that they want to share with people who care about that. A museum is a great place to gather people's passion, you know, and to have, you know, those groups jumping in, giving their expertise. I mean, I, you know, of course it makes sense to vet that kind of thing. Like you can't just assume that just because you're a trained nut, you're correct about every aspect of, of train things, you know, I mean, but that's a great place to start, you know, and, and I, and I say trained up with great affection because I mean, all of us yes. are a nuts about, about whatever, yes, enthusiasts, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, well, you know, you don't 
early republic not aficionado <laughs> yes we'll go with that so yeah exactly you know i think i think you know we want those people um and we should gather them close i know uh, actually sort of an aside thing i mean museums do kind of have love-hate relationships with with those kind you know the yeah, communities sure. because sure. you know they'll jump down your throat in a second you know when there are things and so that's kind of a risk you know yeah. opening that participation but i happen to think the reward is typically a lot higher yeah well it seems like then there's also lots of opportunities to okay you you've segmented and you know so maybe you're going to have an exhibition about this and you're looking for funding like you oh my gosh yeah like mm -hmm. reach out to that population right. and say hey i i know you love this subject and we really wanted to mount this exhibition but we're really having trouble you yeah know? and so it's a way to kind of leverage and then they feel like this was my exhibit i like helped you yeah, especially yeah. if you do like a special opening just for them, you know, yeah, once they're, you know, that kind of thing, that, that could be a wonderful community building, you know, aspect to all this stuff as well. So yeah, I, mean, I think that's totally right. Um, I think the biggest sort of the challenge is when you're really, and, and I'm stepping into dangerous waters here. If you, jump. yeah, oh, I'll just dump it. I mean, if, if you're asking the public to really help your institution interpret things, um, you know, because that becomes really hard, you know, curators are already, you know, for instance, struggling enough with that kind of question, you know, what kind of perspective should be put forth by the institution, you invite the public, absolutely should be part of that conversation. And, and, and this is where, like, my, my risk is that I, my bias is towards public participation, you know, I want that to happen as much as possible. But I also recognize that, that there are times when that becomes really hard, because you can't have a million perspectives in a single exhibition or online um, product and so so it's really it's hard to get that um, that balance again I mean, we're you know we all keep talking about balancing these kind of forces that, that are at play um, you know and, and, and I sort of want to speak against the you know single voice kind of you know curated you know one historian's perspective on something because I don't you know again I you know I, I think that's very well understood at this point that that's probably not the soundest history in the world um, to do that side of things. So, so again, I, you know, I'm looking for balance. You want the expertise of the institution, of the curators, um, of, of, of you know, museum educators balanced with help from the public, and that help can look many different ways. Um, and then I guess in terms of, you know, risk for the, I, I, there's, I don't know, I don't know that there's a lot of risk for the public in participating in museum stuff. I mean, yes, certainly people do get, you know, when I worked at Monticello, our Facebook page was a great online community of people who are incredibly passionate about all kinds of aspects of, of Thomas Jefferson. Um, you know, whether, like I said yesterday, whether it's gardening or architecture or his political philosophies or the day-to-day -day life at Monticello. Um, you know, but boy, he's also a divisive figure, mm -hmm. can be tough, you know, and, and yeah. what was great was our online community did a wonderful job of basically um, kind of monitoring themselves. I mean, they really, it's very, very rare that we ever had to delete any comment anybody made because typically people would throw something out, other people may jump on them, but it died. I mean, like it dies down pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Every once in a while, there's somebody who's just sort of straight up hateful, you know, and that's something that you have to be, um, you know, kind of aware are of. Important. So yes, and so you have terms of service that allow you to do things like delete people's comments yeah, if they have yeah. to. Um, You're a meanie. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we always drink this philosophy of sort of, you know, attack the post, not the poster kinds of things. And so if people post, you know, attacks on individuals, that's pretty easy to delete. I mean, they're like, that, that makes sense. But again, I'm sort of wandering now around this whole idea of what's risky, you know, what's risky for the public. Um, you know, I'm much more, I'm, I believe that there is not a lot of risk in that kind of thing. So it's kind of funny that I got that question. Yeah, <laughs> you, that you but, but I like it, it so. Um, but I mean, other, yeah, you guys. How about any other comments or um, maybe risky situations that are things that you have tried that yeah. have not gone as well as you had hoped, or that you know you have a few members of the museum staff are excited and others are reluctant <laughs> and angry. Yes, <laughs> or not? I, you know. <laughs> yeah, my, my more sort of a question to do with crowdsourcing, but on the perception of crowdsourcing, because mm -hmm. right now it's viewed as a great yeah. resource and those sorts of things. But what about in twenty years' time? I mean, do you? Is there an expectation that you will look back at this crowdsourced data and use that for interpretation 
in a different way, as in this was how this would be interpreted by the public, and therefore it becomes a primary document. Exactly. Oh, yeah, no, I think yeah. That's, there's great research yeah. to be done that's, down the road, yeah. you know, yeah. And that's exactly, I mean, that's how, like, you know, when you, when we are approaching our sources, we approach them in different ways and, and apply, you know, I mean, there's always, you never just take one source and one source, you know, you're always comparing and, and, and sourcing it with other things around it so that one one object, one set of comments doesn't exist yeah, on I its mean, own. Yeah. You know, yeah. like an oral history is a, a fantastic, you know, primary source, but the oral history doesn't stand alone. The right. document doesn't stand alone. Yeah. So everything is, um, you know, analyzed in within the context of which it was collected, how it was saved, who did the collecting, when it was done, who were the audience, you know, all of those things kind of mm -hmm. come into a, a, an overall interpretation of those kinds of sources. And so within that, in terms of this idea of collecting these sorts of mm -hmm. things, is there thought now about the preservation of crowdsourced data in, in those sorts of ways? Mm. All those we collections? We certainly yeah. are. We yeah. are. I don't yeah, know. I mean, I think one of the going to that and thinking about your wonderful Facebook community, like what happens to that discussion? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you get it and out? And how do you get it out? Yeah. And how can you pull that in? Like if it's done with an external service, sometimes you can harvest that metadata. Sometimes there is an export mm. that then you can save, even if you don't, you know, republish that, you can have that. Yeah. But I'm but others it's it's still very unclear and um, yeah. we had a little summit on trying to archive social media last year. I mean, I don't think we've come any farther no. this year <laughs> from the questions and, and issues we even brought up then. So right, there, yeah. there are some tools, but I mean, in, 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 well, I'll say it's, in some ways, I think your best bet is to, if you're, if you have the in-house capability is to create your own community, probably right. allowing people to log in using a social login, right. like their Facebook login. We, we currently don't, don't do that. And I wish we did, but yeah. Certainly the advantages for us of building Children of the Woods Ghetto in-house is that aside from exerting a certain amount of control, it means that we do we, we are able to harvest all the data. We are able to integrate it with existing databases so that the, the content that people create there essentially becomes metadata data attached to the actual primary sources that we have if, if we choose to do so. And then I'd say the only other thing is that what I like about the online environment as a tool for teaching people how to do history it, there's sort of the notion of the internet as being constant beta, you know, always being developed, always changing. And I like being able to reinforce that notion about history itself, that this is what we know about this topic, or in the, in the case of our project, this is what we know about these children up to this point. This is the information people have been able to find. And when you come in, don't take it at face value. Try to replicate the research that other people have done before you. Mm -hmm. Ask questions of the research. So that way, we don't have to worry about people perceiving this as the authoritative history, that it, it almost, you know, that it's always becoming more authoritative and that you're helping us make it so. And one argument I would add to this as to all of the great stuff that Eric outlined and that I know that lots of you are doing crowdsourcing projects yourself. We um, have a crowdsourcing transcription project with the US papers of the War Department. So we've got 45,000 documents that are open for transcription and part of the process of us doing that is, is a two-fold process first we're trying to we're trying to improve our search capacity because these documents are never going to get transcribed we're not going to have the funding to do it so we're not doing transcription in a way that that we're creating a scholarly edition we're not going for formatting we're not going you know we, we just want the transcription um, but in the process of doing that we're learning an immense amount about our audience that we'd never be able to learn any other way by the kinds of documents they select, by the kinds of work they do, by the way they identify themselves, by the people who are attracted to transcription. And you know, it's a range of people who um, are interested in simply transcribing because they like to transcribe and they have not a lot of interest in the documents themselves. And it just like never occurred to me that that was people in the world. But there are, uh, you know, and the genealogists who you'd expect, and 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 then and then you know, a whole cohort of researchers that this is the kind of stats you can't get on your web server, um, and and that's been tremendously important to us in in arguing for more funding in 
in selecting documents to highlight, uh, in nominating documents for transcription. I mean, are we going to get these people to transcribe all 45,000? Probably not. Um, but, but we know where their passions are by the way they describe themselves, and so we can start to direct, uh, direct that kind of stuff. And people were terrified of this project when we launched it because we were making a generalizable tool that other people could use, and then <gasps> There would be transcription, crowdsourced transcription everywhere, and and documentary <laughs> editors would be out of business, <laughs> and everything yeah. was uh, everything would die, and none of that has happened. We have had no vandalism. We have yeah. good preserved conversations amongst the transcribers and the staff, um, and all of that is available for future use in you know thinking about historical memory, about the process of history, the kinds of things that people <coughs> want to do with material. Yes, so we get this little form like name, email address, zip code. Tell us why you want to transcribe. And that is the extent of the form. That's it. That's all we ask for. And the tell us why you want to transcribe, you know, they, f they feel in some senses like they have to justify why they need to be allowed to transcribe. And, and so we get paragraphs of description of their background and their research <laughs> interests. Like, nice yeah, it's, and so, you know, by the end of the year, I hope to write up something really interesting on, on the folks who want to participate, because we have n had no idea other than where, where they came from on the web from our normal sort of Google Analytics kinds of mm -hmm. versions of what they were looking at. Is that a required field? No, it is not. <laughs> yeah, Username and email are the only required fields. And what percentage of people are filling out that? Thing? I would say probably 75 yeah, it's really hmm, that's high. That's interesting. Yeah, it's that's really cool. high. Yeah. I want to be part of the community. Like, eh. Oh, I think, <laughs> I think one, of, one of the other ones is institutional affiliation. <laughs> and, and people are, like, upset if they don't have one. <laughs> and so they then fill out the... Justifying. Justifying. Just their community. Their yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. Community yeah. And yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, this is why I want to be part of that. Yeah. 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 Right, no, right. That's exactly that's true. True. Such seventy-five percent of them saying, "This is why I'm so engaged." Yeah, yeah. I, you know, that's great. <laughs> this is too much. Yeah. All of us yeah. have yeah. probably that. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, yeah. I had that same feeling coming in because, of course, now that I've moved over to the University of Virginia, like two panels now, I've like make sure to mention that I'm part of Monticello so this community understands that I'm a museum person still. Right. Like, you know, I mean, I want yeah. that to I be, understand. you know, yeah. like, I, I'm, I'm part of this group. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I so, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. just funny. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> this is, I think this speaks to the power of culture and identity. You know, people yeah. identify with themselves or identify themselves as part of this group or part of this time even, and, and that's really important to Facilitate the ability. I mean, that's it's, it's, amazing. it's really yeah. Yeah. it's frankly why it's we're all tweeting insane. and reading tweets. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. We're all yeah, exactly. so gated. and and it legitimizes your experience. It says I actually have the ability to comment on this. I have the ability to say something reasonable in this context because I am legitimately part of this community. Right. And that's all good. We had the good luck to get a little bit of um, national press before we launched this project, and I started to get this flood of emails of people saying, "Please let me know when I can sign up," and I was like. <laughs> Where did you all come from? Yeah. <laughs> so, which is great. Oh, what's the URL for the project? Uh, WarDepartmentPapers.org. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever consider not asking people to sign up? No, we didn't because the way the tool works, it's a wiki. It's 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 a wiki that plugs into any content management system, and. The way that wikis get spammed, we just decided we could not allow. N so we create an account for each person who signs up. The sign up comes in, and a staff member then creates them account, and they get an email. Um, so they do have to log in to transcribe, um, because you know anybody who's run an unmanaged wiki before, you know why. <laughs> yeah, it does not take very long. Yeah. For yeah. The and the way the tool works, you can configure yeah. it any way. If you wanted to open one up and not have people sign up. But we kind of, you know, we wanted the data. And I'm surprised at the degree to which we've gotten the data. And is, is actually, sort of building on that question about the 75%, is there anybody that seems to be basically providing fake data? I mean, like, I hate to no, say it, but no, I would No, they, think they leave not. it, they I mean, leave it blank. I've never had that experience. They leave right. it blank, but yeah. they don't falsify it. Yeah, or they're, yeah. you know, a fake name or whatever. No. Yeah. They just don't I mean, fill that it out because it's not required. Either. They just. And we've had no vandalism. Right. None. Same with us. Do you have multiple then um, transcribe the same documents through? Sometimes. 
Oh, well, we have an editor that, that goes and then second passes them. Yep. So I think this is all um, kind of then leads up to our sort of final question that really is for everyone to kind of get back to the big question of what is the point of a museum website? What are the <laughs> point? What's the point of a history museum website that might be slightly different than you know another genre of museum site? And I think that um, you know, can we? I'm, and I'm going to like sort of answer this in a number of questions, sort of pulling together some of the comments that um, that we've all made here today. Um, you know, can we realistically? Um, offer or target different audiences with perhaps different types of um, history work. Um, you know, Eric was talking about these different circles. Can we, are, are there ways that we can more easily invite the public in to do some of our public history work at different levels? From sharing your a personal experience to something like transcription, and then you know the harder level, which is the the, the contextual interpretation um, level. Um, can we also use our websites and should we be using our websites to um, engage the public in difficult subjects um, that may not work depending on what your mission of your museum is? I mean that's gonna that's gonna depend on an institution, but could that be a safe space? Can you create a space for that sort of discussion or create a um, Perhaps in your design, in say, um, you know, a small, if you have a special exhibition on you know, slavery in New England that um, distinguishes, you know, um, a, some sort of like an online label copy where you have, um, I don't want to say like, you know, green, blue, yellow, and orange, but some sort of way that distinguishes like different kinds of interpretation. So we have, you know, our curator's interpretation here. We have, um, you know, this historian who it doesn't, is not affiliated with our institutions or of interpretation here, um, you know, our a student a or, you know, an advisory board member or someone else. Like, are there ways that we can use some of the advantages of the web and new media to kind of create some of those layers of content um, that draws on some of the basics? Um, and I guess in this sense, I would not say, you know, across every bit of a site, but perhaps you know, targeted. as targeted. Um, and al also, are there ways um, that both, uh, you know, Sharon and David were talking about of creating some real um, instructions, if you will, for teaching historical methods, historical thinking skills through um, digital assets and through like doing some different, uh, some different kinds of history work through um, some of the sources that are available, but also in a way that um, will encourage um, and teach users, doesn't matter who they are, about sourcing and about comparing and about um, you know pulling in secondary interpretation and then forming you know with trying to answer questions, historical questions, um, and, and coming up with an answer <laughs> that is not necessarily the, the answer. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, I want to throw that out because I think everybody probably has some ideas, um, and um, we also have come up with and, and shown some excellent examples. But you know, this is not. Um, we have institutions of different sizes. Um, history museums are the most numerous and tend to be the smallest. Um, you know, they're even in looking at AAM's um, visitation stats. You know, the median number of visitors to history museums is the smallest, and they're the largest group of people. Um, we've got a yeah. lot of small institutions out there um, that are sort of, you know, and they may not be struggling, but they're, you know, they're doing a lot on a shoestring. And that might be another reason to talk about <coughs> how to leverage the use of software for service, software as service, to support those uh, smaller institutions, whether it means doing really good work with a YouTube channel instead of your own, you know, yeah. your own site, or with Flickr, or with Omeka.net, or with Drupal Gardens, or, you know, all of those kinds of things that you can just go sign up for an account and make it part of your, part of your organization. Uh, and, and, and also some of the ways in which that takes some pressure off the really scared point. folks. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have a tweet up that doesn't live on our server. Right? Those kinds of, those kinds of things. 
but we are. I just wanted to add when you mentioned TweetUp, it made me think really one of the first quasi crowdsourcing experiments we did at the Holocaust Museum was essentially a, a, a TweetUp and it was a live tweeting event. And we had only about eight people. A lot of them were museum people. Um, and it was a, uh, it was essentially a crowdsourced tour of the architecture of the museum, where it was the visitors' interpretations of the architecture that was being pushed out by the visitors themselves to their own followers, as well as to the museum's feet. Hmm. Fantastic, we reached a, a lot of people with only a handful of folks participating, and we chose something that we knew was safe. That we that we were comfortable with people interpreting, which was the architecture. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, you know, if, if if you're looking for an easy way to start, that's you, you could do worse than that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was just. Um, I was kind of curious about your thoughts on barriers to participation, which is partly why I asked about registration and mm -hmm. you know, know. he's asked bad magnets, so that's fair enough. But <clears throat> yeah. um, and my previous research had been on using games to lower the barriers to participation. Yeah. Um, but there are also times when you want the barriers right. to be there. <laughs> so right. yeah. absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think it's a really important question, and we try to make things as easy as possible. Um, there are there are huge barriers, and that's I think another argument for going where people are, and then trying to push them back to your content um, and to, to your expertise. And you know that that's I think the really wonderful argument for Flickr Commons was that people were already there, are already there. I hope they continue to stay. Th I hope Flickr Commons continues to stay there. I hope Yahoo continues <laughs> to survive. Um, <laughs> And, and but that's also the risk of going to those places is that if you don't own it, it poof, Yahoo goes bankrupt. Um, maybe or Google will again, buy it. or maybe Google will buy it. Yeah. Um, so Google. yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on what you have run into as barriers for participation. Um, the kinds of things that you've heard from your visitors or your participants about why they are maybe not doing things, not visiting, not not participating. No one has any data on our well, on our yeah. our negative data period. I'm yeah. uh, sure you do. What I found um, when I was work, working in a museum instead of over museums is that the uh, the visitors didn't often didn't feel qualified yeah. mm, because they weren't museum people, they weren't curators, they weren't historians, they didn't feel like they really had had buy-in because mm. museums still have that aura of being the yep. other, and that's the place that you go in order to absorb. But right. it's still not yep. yours, mm -hmm. and so they, they didn't have that that personal engagement where they felt like they were good enough. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and was that for um, participation that was on site, or was that also for for online? Um, um, it was Mostly, mostly mm -hmm. online. Yeah. Um, okay. But we would try to do like on-site stuff where we would ask people to come in and scan their their family archives. Oh. And we got like two people who showed up because huh. they didn't feel like their stuff was good. Were they? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's. I mean, I think hmm. that's like the aspect shift of museums. Like we have to stop feeling, you know, presenting ourselves as that sort of authority on a hill. You know, like, but say. You know, we want you like you really. It's like it's like really reassuring kind of tone that you know your perspective is valid. We want to hear that. You know. Do you but, think uh, that comes down to website design? Yeah. It's really key. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's something like I wonder whether in, in that yeah. sort of circumstance whether yeah. the website looks different or used different language or something, yeah, whether more people would have felt. Yeah, yeah, like they could yeah. approach. Yeah. Yeah. Talked to that quite directly because I did a comparative study of a crowdsourcing interface that didn't have any gamification element. It looked very Web 2.0 mm -hmm. with one with gamification elements. Mm -hmm. And even people who worked in cultural heritage fields didn't contribute, were very intimidated by contributing to mm -hmm. information about museum objects in a Web 2.0 kind of socially thing. Mm -hmm. But they were fine with it when there was a game character inviting them to participate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. But I mean, it's a small more mascots, so. is what you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 There's also um, a study that the IMLS is currently funding at Michigan State um, that's looking at um, facilitating 
um, dialogue and online museum environments, and they're sort of looking at, it's based in science centers, but it would be really interesting to see how sort of that model yeah, could translate great. to history centers. So they're looking at Science Buzz at Science Museum of Minnesota, mm -hmm. which is you know really sort of structured and built on its own platform. Mm -hmm. And then they're looking at um, the work Beck Tench is doing at um, Museum of Life and Science in North Carolina, which is a lot more sort of distributed across platforms where people tend to already be, but that the museum has sort of less control over the architecture of. Um, and it would be really interesting to sort of look at the models they're developing of how museum staff can create community in the science space and then sort of see how that might translate you know, to history museums. But to Parian's point also, there's another IMLS funded study from a few years ago about museums as really, uh, museums and library websites as tr really truly trusted online resources for the community. Yeah. And that's yeah. from like 2008. Yeah. Yeah. So a little bit before we were all sort of really getting into crowdsourcing to the degree that we're talking about it now. Um, and it makes me wonder if, you know, if, if we do have that sort of, if there is that base level of trust and maybe that's sort of the barrier to getting people to want to be involved yeah. because they don't trust themselves as much as, <laughs> as, <laughs> as they trust yeah. us. Yeah. Which is, I mean, a nice yeah. problem to have, but how do you, you know, yeah. overcome and I, you that? Know, we've been having this conversation for a really long time in and around DC, as I'm sure you know, with the Smithsonian 2.0 conference and, and those kinds of things. And I have fundamentally argued for really, really a long time that that, re that is a function of design, mm -hmm. to be yeah. able to clearly differentiate between the public and the source right. of, dare I say, authority, momentary yeah. authority, that, yeah. that, that we have to pay really, really, really careful attention to that in a way that we haven't yet. Yeah, I think it's a degree of intentionality that yeah. we haven't quite all wrapped our heads around yet. Uh, I'm in a, actually in an archive in an art museum. Mm -hmm. And so we've been sort of trying to find some ways to expose the archives, you know, through this art culture and talking about um, also giving people these tools to understand, you know, ways to approach art. But, you know, I'm more concerned about how they approach the history of art. Yep. So we talked about a digitization project where we then let um, users contribute to a sort of vocabulary or a, you know, a dictionary of terms mm -hmm. so that maybe we provide sort of the scholarly or the, you know, the, the standards and then allow people to sort of contribute their kind of public understanding of what those terms are mm -hmm. so that we get at some of our goals of educating but also allow them to, you know, engage with us and with each other through yeah. the site. So. That's great. Yeah. I'm just going to say about barriers to participation. We've been doing cleanups and doing that with NASA. And they've done an incredible job of building this huge crazy crazy community, community in which space can, yes, space tweets, <laughs> yeah, space tweets. Yeah. Um, but they've spawned off their own culture and community of websites and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And I really think they're a strong group that could actually build things in a crowdsourcing sense mm -hmm. once you've engaged them and gotten that. Yeah. Excited. There's pros and cons to that community in that some people can feel intimidated to get yes. into that community. Mm -hmm. But once they do, they're really great advocates for your organization and can basically take what you want to do and spread it out. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really good approach that we're looking into. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to go back for a second to your discussion about separating out the user generated content very clearly from the, um, from the curated content. Are there people that have kind of successfully run a program, meaning successfully meaning just getting getting a lot of content uh, uh, contributed? And then, is there any kind of reporting on what the results were? I mean, was there good things to say about it, bad things? That did, it, did they feel it confused the visitors? I mean, is there any sort of? You know, I don't know that I don't know that there is, and maybe that's maybe that's the next thing that 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 we need to study. I mean, uh, certainly of the. We participated in, a, in an archive building project that was, was, uh, was dispersed first and then tried sort of half-heartedly to engage con community contributions. It was the Bracero History Archive. Mm -hmm. And so it was built by professionals first, um, curators and historians, and, and, but in, con in conjunction with community organizations. And so all of it is user, ge it's all user-generated content, but there was you know sort of um, professionally taken oral histories. Uh, and then we opened up a collecting portal. And we did sort of nothing 
not really a lot to support that collecting portal, and the, the response to it has been as enthusiastic as our support of it. <laughs> and that's just, that's just, you know, yeah. like the grant was over, thank you, NEH, and we had no staff time, and we had no staff money. But and it, it was in a, a physical exhibit, too. There was, like, at the yes, at NEH. Yes, and, the, and there was and a there traveling was physical a, exhibit, and it included. There was a workstation. Yeah, there, so that folks could so contribute from. Uh, but the way that we did that is that, you know, we did, you know, different font, different color, different, you know, this is, this is user collect, user provided content that has not been curated is basically what we said. It was, you know, this is, has not been, the metadata has not been created by a curator or a historian. It was, was collected from the web. And that seems really, that seems very clear to me, but we didn't sort of follow up with user study, is I guess the. Some yeah. use cases that absolutely you know, to, uh, to, to know if you know even if there's problems, just to know what the pitfalls might lie, yeah. so that we could go yeah. for it. Because a lot of it, a lot of it, I think it is is convincing the staff and the management, the administration. Right, absolutely. And you need to have the metrics day. to do that. And so, there's an IMLS proposal. <laughs> <laughs> So I just want to, um, we're getting pretty close to the end of our session here, and I, I just want to sort of, again, throw out, I don't have an answer to this, but I am sort of wondering, are we, have we moved sort of past this time where we can um, do the kind of intense <coughs> online exhibition at a history site that really does incorporate multiple voices, that uses, it was a, you know, two or three year IMOS grant, which was not like something that was put together quickly. Um, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily the best format and it's, you know. But it's been right in the community as a successful site. Um, and, was and it is in flat, and it was like, I think, all released as well there. They made their sort of code available. But the idea of, of having five distinct um, groups and voices with different um, interpretations of a, um, what some people see as a controversial event and other communities do not see as a controversial event. You know, a raid on Deerfield is spoken from the, the, the perspective of the folks who were attacked <laughs> at a specific point. Um, you know, but there was of course a history of conflict among um, English, French colonial settlers and um, native peoples who were living in this area. So you've got um, one way of dealing with um, a controversial topic. And um, again, I'm not saying that this is necessarily the only model, but I am sort of wondering, like, can we get to a, back to a, a point where doing this kind of interpretation, um, maybe for a um, for a permanent exhibition or something that is available online to not only demonstrate the complicated nature of doing history, but also engage the visitor by looking and, and a little bit of modeling to say, look, um, we don't have one answer. Um, you're not going to find one answer, and here are some. Here are a bunch of sources. Here are a bunch of interpretations, and you know, um, use what you're learning here, you know, and uh, and apply that to other um, historical questions and situations. And so I'm just, I, I'm hoping, and I think that we can use the digital media in a way that we may not be, we may not have the space um, physically on site to do it, but it can be done here. Maybe um, you know, in, in even a different way that's more accessible on a you know on a mobile device or something like that, so you can actually take that with you as you're going through a community um, and, and hear about different stories and conflicts you know over time. But you know, the, the Deerfield site is a tremendously rich and full site, but I think that doesn't preclude doesn't us from, from, from yeah taking three or four items mm -hmm. or documents and, and trying to, to build that cluster mm -hmm. uh, of content and multiple voices and multiple perspectives around yeah. um, this whole other one. Yeah. Uh, just to speak to that, I mean, you're, you're talking about how do we tell the story, basically, and how do we solicit the story. One of the things that I've, you know, as not a museum professional with history and being able to travel around the world now to see archives, libraries, museums behind the scenes, the thing that I would love to see as an enthusiast is Tell us how you did this to begin with. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, there's so we much we can learn about this. Uh, we did a whole session on that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But that's just something that else where it really yeah. gives us the ability to yeah. do this. You know, yeah. have quick behind the scenes segments or something. Just do it yeah. with a flip cam. Show us and how you're doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. love that. Yeah. I love that. In person, do that. Okay. Yeah. 
right. Yeah. So we've sort of reached our 12:30 end time already.